Okay, I hope this is going to be coherent because I have quite a few things that I want to touch on. Um, so we're living in a world where many ask us not to compare struggles. Uh, we're told that um, some forms of struggle are beyond compare, in particular when it comes to the question of violence. But what we should know is that the technologies and the corporations which purvey violence are global, and they've always been. So I'll start with an example. In October, there was an uprising in Nigeria, which spread throughout the country, started in Lagos, and it was centered on this police unit called uh, SARS. So the campaign was NSARS, many of you may have heard of it. What became apparent, despite the fact that the initial response from some in the UK was to call on the UK government to impose sanctions, um, what we found out was actually that the SARS unit had been provided with not just equipment, but also training from the UK between 2016 and 2020. And so what that should kind of give us pause for thought about is the fact that a lot of the time when we don't see it, the kinds of violences that we're seeing in the global south, particularly in relation to the ways that states repress people, are being sponsored and also facilitated by the governments that we turn to as the moral arbiters. I think another example of that was after the Arab Spring in 2012, when David Cameron um, sought, to, uh, prom um, sought to promote the arms trade um, or British arms companies, um, in particular BAE systems in the Middle East. And what we kind of see continuously is this contradiction between the presentation of the West on the global stage as the people who protect democracy and the people who protect kind of morality versus the reality of their actions, which is as a facilitator and often sponsor of forms of violence in the global South. So I want to kind of draw this into conversation with the violence of border regimes, and I'm going to use this and um, stretch this example of Nigeria. Um, one thing that we do know for, uh, I'll start with the example. So in, two, in April 2005, the U British government imposed a ban on entry visas for young Nigerians aged between 18 and 30 who intended to visit the UK for the first time. At the same time, ethnicity data gathering distinguished the category of Black Nigerian from the category of Black African. And what we saw in the aftermath of that was a reorganization of the UK's embassies in Nigeria, such that the UK funded and sponsored the um, expansion of biometric data gathering um, and scanners in Nigeria. And this is a clear example of how the British state seemingly innocuously has provided the very same technologies for surveillance um, and di um, disciplining um, that, it, uh, that it claims to be preventing. And what we, of, um, what we find in this is that very often when we kind of talk about the, well, the things that we get pulled to defending things like the AIDS budget, et cetera, a lot of this ends up going into the provision of arms and the um, provision of quote unquote security. And this is all happening against the backdrop of a continual global crisis in which anxieties around global terror have been leveraged by elites in the global south as a means to access the financial and military support from the West to prop up their regimes. And that's in turn used to quell political dissent. And within this framework, what's happening is we're seeing violence exported, not just physically, but also discursively into the global south. For example, we continue to talk about um, state violence in the language of defense as if the imperialist Western state and their gatekeeper states in the global south aren't the chief purveyors of violence around the world. But what we're also seeing is the, di um, the displacing of political questions um, uh, through, the lang or through languages and doctrines of security and cultural essentialism. So for example, in Nigeria, we see ecological crisis caused by, for example, um, uh, oil um, extraction in the, Delta, in the Niger Delta region. We see um, an ecological disaster caused by the disappearance of Lake Chad in the North, but then that peers back to us as the language of security through the kind of vectors of Boko Haram in the North and um, Niger Delta kidnappings in um, the Niger Delta.
And so where we are offered new solutions or where there's a possibility of finding new solutions um, to prevent um, environmental degradation, to prevent, um, political, um, to prevent political repression, the language of it um, reconstitutes itself as security and cultural essentialism in order to prevent us from being able to see those solutions. And so what we come to here is a recognition that the demand to end the arms trade must also then be a demand for abolition. So we connect the dots, for example, through NSARS between the, polit uh, the brutality of policing, not just in the global north, but also in the global south. Um, and the, um, the way in which those violences are tied back to the imperialist state. Um, and so then we see a demand for abolition, not just of the prison, but we have to be connecting that demand of the abolition of prisons also to the broader demand of the abolition of borders. And we know in the UK that a significant number of people who've died after contact with the state have died um, as a consequence of contact with border agents. We also know that even in the pandemic, the UK government has remained resolute in the notion that it wants to kind of send people off in charter fights um, through deportations. And this also requires an abolition of empire and all the other kind of repressive functions of states, which um, are the imperative that drive the proliferation of violence globally. And what I want to kind of spend the last few minutes talking about um, is the fact that there is a tradition which saw this. And it was an internationalist history um, of anti-colonial um, of anti-colonial struggle, which connected the dots between the violence that we were experiencing domestically and the violence that was being wreaked globally. And what that tells us is that the issues that we're dealing with aren't just intersecting, they're actually interdependent struggles um, and interdependent um, structures. So for example, let's go back to the um, what I started with in terms of Nigeria. What we know is that Nigeria makes more money um, from remittances sent back by people that it's sent abroad um, than it does from the oil trade. Um, and that's been the case for the last few years. And so what we're seeing is the, de um, the degradation of conditions in the global south in order to force people into the global north in order to plug labor gaps. Um, and so where we kind of think of these as issues which join at a point, which produce um, uh, some kind of synergy at, at certain points, what we have to understand is that these are all um, interdependent. And by inter interdependent, I mean that if one thing, um, in order to achieve or attain um, the demands that we have in terms of ending the arms trade, we have to um, attain the demands um, that we have as it, as it pertains to abolition, specifically, with them preventing or ending the justifications that are given for the, um, the continued proliferation of weapons. And so I kind of want to end, I think I have about two minutes left, um, by saying this. As I mentioned off the top, we're living in a time when we're told consistently not to compare struggles um, between peoples, and we're told to show up for each other as allies, as opposed to as people in a united global struggle. That's completely out of step with the history that has taught us that we have the power to change the world. And I think that's a kind of result of a sense of despair or a sense that things are too much for us to overcome. And what I wanna inject in the last minute is to remind people that the unity that we have, the possibility of unity that we have is not simply one of sympathy with each other or even of empathy. It's through a recognition that when we're fighting for each other, when we're fighting to emancipate each of us from the violent structures of global imperialism, we're fighting for ourselves as well. What happens to the young boy who's um, brutalized by, an, uh, by a SARS cop in Nigeria is deeply and inex inextricably ties to what happens to me in terms of how I experience my blackness in the UK and my interactions with the state. And I kind of want us to hold that as we go into the conversation or end that.